All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us for Grand Rounds today. Uh, we have a great Grand Rounds in store for today. Uh, we'll get started. I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Stiefel, who's the Associate Professor of Medicine and Chief of Infectious Disease at the VA and Chief, uh, Vice Chair of the Faculty Development for the Department of Medicine. She will introduce our keynote speaker and eventually the panel for us as well. Thanks, Saurav. Um, so I want to thank uh, Bob and Keith for letting us do what is, I think, our third in our series of Grand Rounds on faculty development. Dr. Greenfield did mentorship for the Department of Medicine um, two years ago. Last year we had a Grand Rounds on promotions and tenure, and this year we thought we would have one on building a career as a clinician educator. We have many fabulous teachers in our Department of Medicine. It's not always quite as clear how to translate that into promotion and into national recognition, and that was what we hoped we could address with this um, session today. So I want to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, she is Dr. Patricia Thomas. She's a nationally recognized educator, author, and physician, and she is the Vice Dean of Education at the School of Medicine since February of 2014. Dr. Thomas oversees, directs, and ultimately evaluates all the medical education and teaching programs at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. As part of her charge, she explores ways to enhance the groundbreaking Western Reserve II curriculum, which is a student-centered approach to learning, emphasizing research, scholarship, clinical mastery, teamwork, and leadership. Prior to her arrival at Case, she worked as a general internist and clinician educator for 25 years at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and her interest in the career path of the medical educator has paralleled her growth as an educator over that time period. She's been invited um, to speak at regional and national and international meetings. In 2006, she participated in the AMC's GEA Consensus Conference on Educational Scholarship, which subsequently published a landmark consensus document on educational scholarship. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patricia Thomas. Thank you, Usha, for that uh, kind introduction. I'm always a little humbled uh, to talk about my own career. Um, when uh, folks talk about successful careers in academic medicine, they often refer to faculty being on a trajectory. And I never felt I was on a trajectory. I was more on a sine wave <laughs> as I was going through it, as you will hear. Um, but I'm a great case study in what to do and what not to do. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, that will come through in the, in the talk. Here are my learning objectives. Uh, again, uh, my career really paralleled this uh, incredible uh, evolution of a clinician educator pathway in academic medicine. We'll review that a little bit and why it came to be. Um, define educational scholarship and how it's demonstrated in promotion packets. Uh, and then uh, I hope for each of you who is in uh, this kind of a career path um, that you'll leave today thinking about one new strategy in 2018 uh, to support your future promotion in the pathway. Uh, my disclosures are that I am editor of a curriculum uh, development uh, monograph um, and get uh, small uh, royalties uh, from that. And uh, I did not plan to be an academic, major disclosure here. And again, that could be the first thing that uh, perhaps the rest of you uh, can learn. Uh, but you never know where a path is going to take you uh, in life. Uh, and uh, I had some serendipity along the way, which is uh, why I ended up uh, where I am today. Um, as I said, my career, my personal career, actually paralleled uh, in the 1990s, this uh, tremendous increase in the number, absolute numbers of faculty uh, in medical schools, and most of those came on in clinical roles. Um, and then I was in a place uh, that really struggled with identifying what to do with this particular pathway as it was being uh, struggled with uh, nationally. I was the first in my family to go into medicine. Uh, I was advised to uh, from my small liberal arts college in Maine to apply to my state medical school, which I did uh, successfully, thank goodness, um, and then stayed there for uh, my residency program and rheumatology fellowship, met my husband, and then launched my career uh, for about seven years as a trailing spouse, as they say. He was being recruited all over the place as a triple threat, and I was following him around the country. 
1987, he was being recruited back to Baltimore, uh, and I was looking for a job. Uh, we had a house in Memphis, Tennessee we couldn't sell, a new house in Maryland that we just uh, had a mortgage on. And I took this job at the East Baltimore Medical Plan, which is a small health center about a mile from Johns Hopkins Hospital in uh, East Baltimore. Really rough neighborhood. Um, I, I had an indication that when I went for the interview, uh, I could not get a taxi to pick me up and take me back to the airport from this uh, health center. It was such a rough neighborhood. Um, but I took a, a job there. It eventually was bought by uh, Johns Hopkins as they were kind of getting their toe into the managed care uh, world back then uh, and worked full time uh, as a clinician with uh, an underserved population, a resource limited uh, center. Uh, Hopkins at that time sent uh, their um, uh, residents for ambulatory blocks to that center, and uh, one of them went back and spoke to the chairman about my teaching, said you should really bring this person on board, and I actually got a phone call from the chairman of medicine at Johns Hopkins inviting me. So major imposter syndrome, I don't know how it happened, uh, but I ended up joining Johns Hopkins in 1988. Um, and it was a very unusual uh, position to be in. Uh, at that time, most faculty had trained and had some connection uh, in their training uh, to Johns Hopkins. It was very unusual to come from the outside uh, unless you were a major scientist of some sort. Uh, Hopkins really saw itself as a tertiary and quaternary uh, health care powerhouse uh, and felt that all primary care and secondary care belonged in the community and that wasn't part of what they did. And there was really an anti-generalism sentiment. Uh, the chairman told me, my residents do not go into primary care. You're going to teach an ambulatory curriculum here, uh, but uh, that's not what this is about. Um, they were responding to the RRC saying that you had to shift 30 percent of your training into an ambulatory uh, site. Um, so they sent half their residents to this uh, health center that I was in, and I was the on-site uh, faculty member uh, who was supposed to create the curriculum for that. Uh, promotion was not even in my uh, thinking box at that point. It just wasn't even uh, a likelihood. The people who were promoted to professors were Nobel Prize winners. They were members of the Institute of Medicine. Uh, and it was all a black box. There was nothing like this, Usha, that told a faculty member how to get promoted. You really relied on your chair uh, to get you through the process. So um, it was all a black box uh, to the faculty. Um, so there I was. I was not trained at Hopkins. I was doing general internal medicine in a place that did not value general internal medicine. And uh, I was a woman. So in 1988, uh, Hopkins had promoted 19 women to the level of professor in 100 years of its history. It was nearly 100 years old. Uh, the first woman uh, promoted was Florence Sabin, who had been one of their own graduates, went on to become an anatomist and uh, describe the histology of the brain. And then the second woman to be promoted was promoted in 1959, a little bit of a gap, uh, and it was the famous Helen Tosig that we all learned the Blalock-Tosig procedure, famous pediatric cardiologist. Uh, the third woman to be promoted, uh, again, a little bit of a gap, uh, Carolyn Thomas, no relation. Uh, but she was a very uh, interesting woman. She was a very early uh, epidemiologist, really, and she set out uh, to uh, understand the precursors for cardiovascular uh, disease. And she did that by creating a survey that she sent to graduates of the School of Medicine uh, and asked them what was going on in their lives and their health and what were they doing, were they exercising, were they smoking, um, and uh, did this every year for decades wrote a personal letter, this was not in the age of word processors, and got tremendous response. And she built uh, quite a, a record of publication there. Uh, when she uh, left, she turned that uh, precursor study over to Mike Clagg, who was a recent graduate of the General Internal Medicine Fellowship. Mike went on to develop his own uh, career in hypertension and eventually became uh, dean of Bloomberg School of Public Health. So, a uh, great uh, legacy uh, from uh, Dr. Thomas as well. 
And then even uh, Bernadine Healy, who was number eight, uh, was uh, 1982, very shortly before I arrived. So uh, after that, it obviously picked up a little bit. But there was definitely a feeling that women were not going to be very successful uh, in the promotion process. Uh, I was very fortunate, and uh, despite having this uh, uh, humble uh, expectation of what I was going to be there, Hopkins was a single-track system. It was up and out, and I thought, well, eventually I'll be out. Um, but uh, I had great mentors who uh, were much more uh, positive about me. The first was my division director, David Levine, uh, who was the first uh, director of the Division of Internal Medicine. He was not allowed to call it. General Internal Medicine, because Victor McCusick did not want general in his department. Uh, but he was just a go-getter. He was uh, somebody who loved mentoring. There is now a mentoring award uh, named after him. He would grab you in the hall and talk to you for 20 minutes about uh, your life and how things were going. Uh, he uh, inherited me. He didn't ask for me, but I landed up in his division, and he was always incredibly supportive. And he said, Pat, you know you're an educator. Uh, you should go take the faculty development program at the Bayview Medical Center on teaching skills that was run by uh, Randy Barker and curriculum development run by uh, David Kern. Uh, this was a HRSA-funded primary care training grant uh, program. They had it for 20 years, uh, but the uh, program was 10 months long. You did a half day a week, went over to the Bayview Medical Center, and had uh, incredible interactive uh, training in the curriculum development program. You actually had a mentored uh, curriculum project there. Uh, that program was transformative for me. Uh, I learned so many new skills that I had to immediately apply what I was doing uh, that it really was incredibly helpful. And it became an academic home because this was a, a community that did believe in generalism. They had a general internal medicine track in the residency program. Um, and really put forward uh, the new science that was generalism. Uh, I did this, and then I was asked to be a facilitator in those programs, and after a few years, Dave said, well, we really need to put this uh, method that we're teaching into a, a textbook, a monograph of some sort, and I was very lucky to be invited to be part of that writing team. Uh, two years of very hard work writing, uh, doing research, uh, critiquing each other's writing, arguing about what the textbook should look like, et cetera. Uh, but eventually, uh, this uh, curriculum development and medical education was born. It filled a real niche. There wasn't anything like it out there, uh, and it soon got adopted by faculty development programs around the country. We were invited to speak around the country, and eventually we were invited uh, internationally. We presented uh, the six-step process in Korea and uh, Lima, Peru, uh, Uganda, and um, the Middle East, and uh, Dave has been to Saudi Arabia most uh, recently. Um, this became the foundation of Dave's promotion uh, to uh, professor and uh, eventually mine as well. My other great mentor was uh, Dr. David Hellman. Uh, he was the program director that I first worked under uh, to create an ambulatory curriculum in this a uh, little uh, outback, I used to call it, for the residency program. Um, and uh, he eventually uh, invited me to do ambulatory curriculum for the entire program, then become an associate program director. I was the first uh, female uh, faculty lead, uh, I was called a firm faculty leader uh, in the residency training program. Um, so uh, he gave me increasing responsibility, having not known me uh, very well at all. Um, David was also responsible, as uh, I think Dr. Armitage is, in scheduling medical grand rounds. And at some point, he assigned me medical grand rounds, and I was, I was terrified. Um, medical grand rounds at Hopkins is delivered in uh, an ancient herd hall, a wood-paneled hall with a very steep uh, audience looking down at you. It's called the pit. Faculty refer to it as the pit. Um, and on Friday mornings, everyone shows up at 8 o'clock in a white coat and an Osler tie. If you've ever been trained at Hopkins, you get an Osler tie, and people wear that into their 80s. Um, so it's, it's very scary. Uh, that's all I can say. Uh, and I said, what in the world am I going to tell these Nobel Prize winners? Um, what have I got to say? Um, it was designed that you had 30 minutes. Uh, you were supposed to start with a case. 
uh, if you could, interview the patient in front of the audience and then present uh, your didactic uh, all in 30 minutes. So the case I took uh, was a woman from my practice who had been a phlebotomist who uh, called up uh, on a Friday night and said she had some tingling in her arm uh, and uh, no history of uh, hurting her arm or neck or anything. I talked to her on the phone. I said, well, this doesn't sound too bad. I'm thinking it's a peripheral uh, nerve uh, compression of one sort or another. We'll, we'll take a look at it next week in the office. And unfortunately, she presented to the ED on Saturday uh, with a full stroke. Um, the etiology of it was that she'd had a carotid artery dissection uh, from her husband strang uh, trying to strangulate her. Um, and I presented this case. It was a very unusual kind of topic uh, for that particular uh, audience. But as my friends in general internal medicine said, Pat, you did great. Uh, you know, you could hear a pin drop in the room. Um, it, it was really quite moving because her story was so moving. Uh, and then David said, this is great, uh, presented at our uh, annual internal medicine. He was the ACP governor. He invited me there. Again, he did what a mentor did. He just got me out there uh, talking about it. And that was eventually uh, published in the New England Journal as a case. Uh, the current uh, vice dean for medical education then came to the Department of Medicine and said, you know, we did this major reform of the curriculum at Hopkins, and every single discipline added ambulatory medicine except medicine. Um, so you need to develop an ambulatory medicine clerkship. And, and David again turned to me and uh, said, uh, do this, uh, bring together uh, this great primary care network, which we did not have at Hopkins, right? Um, and uh, put the students out there and develop a curriculum. So uh, again, very grateful that he trusted me to do that. Uh, that became my laboratory as an educator. Um, that clerkship was the first clerkship to use standardized patients for teaching and assessment, uh, to use learning portfolios, and to use team-based learning. Uh, and every single one of those interventions uh, I was able to um, uh, write up uh, and publish and, uh, again, helped my career there. Um, so uh, many uh, thanks to uh, David and uh, his uh, trust of, of me. Um, once I got into the clerkship uh, director mode, I became involved in medical student education, and Kathy DeAngelis' successor, David Nichols, uh, was a pediatric anesthesiologist who, turned, who became vice dean. Uh, and he asked me uh, in uh, 2003, again, hardly knowing me, uh, to be the associate uh, dean for curriculum. Hopkins had never had a curriculum dean before that, amazingly. Uh, but he was getting ready for an LCME self-study. He knew he didn't know that. Um, and wanted to give it to somebody, he gave it to me. Uh, but uh, again, very grateful uh, that I was allowed to take that role. We went on to develop a new curriculum for Hopkins, the Genes to Society curriculum, and build our new uh, medical school building. And because of that role, I was able to apply for the current role I have now uh, at Case. So uh, in a nutshell, that's how it all happened. While I was doing that, this is what was happening nationally uh, to uh, medical school faculty. This is showing uh, from the AAMC, 1984 over on the left to 2009, uh, absolute numbers of full-time clinical uh, MD faculty. And you see this steep increase in the non-tenure track uh, and a fairly flat line in the tenure track. And you can see overall then what is happening is that the percentage of tenured eligible or tenured eligible uh, faculty dropped uh, over that uh, period of time. This is the same da data looking at absolute numbers. Again, uh, starting uh, in uh, 1984, I'm coming to Hopkins here. Um, most of the faculty were on tenure tracks at that point, and then somewhere around 1995 it started to flip. Uh, the medical schools and academic medical centers realized clinical revenue was important. Uh, there are people here in this audience that can talk about this better than I can. Uh, but uh, they needed the faculty to generate that clinical revenue. And they started to hire uh, large numbers of uh, clinical faculty who were not going to be research-based uh, faculty, uh, which is a big change. Um, here is another way of showing uh, these are new hires coming on in the non-tenure track and in the tenure track, and it's going down and down uh, going forward. 
Um, and that started a national conversation. What is this? What does that mean to be a faculty member if uh, what we're hiring is people who are just uh, uh, being clinically active and not contributing in the way that faculty have traditionally uh, contributed to uh, discovery of new knowledge, uh, et cetera, uh, in our medical schools? Well, as we were having that conversation, um, uh, Hopkins, which had a single track, had no way of understanding what was happening to these faculty. Uh, just as we assumed that women weren't going to make it, there was a lot of scuttlebutt that clinician educators were never going to get promoted. Uh, but we didn't know the data, and you didn't, if you didn't track it, you didn't know the data. Um, so I was asked by my chair to head up a subcommittee uh, to actually look at that. Um, and uh, we sent out a survey to the Department of Medicine faculty here in 1999, uh, and we asked them to uh, just self-identify themselves. Uh, were they a basic researcher? Were they a clinical researcher? Were they an academic clinician? Uh, we had some definitions about the amount of time you spent in research that kind of differentiated that. Or did you feel you were a teacher clinician? And then uh, we looked at what rank they were, adjusting for age, gender, years at rank, and how satisfied they were with their job. And what you can see here, using uh, basic research here as one, um, much lower odds of uh, being at higher rank in any of those uh, other three tracks. So this was an issue uh, in this institution as it was nationally. Uh, how do we reward these folks if they're not going to be uh, getting their usual uh, rewards through uh, the scholarship of discovery, uh, as it was uh, noted in our promotion packet? Um, not surprisingly, uh, these groups were also less satisfied. The numbers here are 0.39, 0.39, and 0.13. Less satisfied with their careers and had intentions uh, to leave the institution. Um, well, I, I don't have time and the time I have to talk about what we did about that, what Hopkins did about that, but it was painful. Um, as I said, we turned to the national scene and said, what is going on here uh, with the professoriate? And it turned out this was not just a problem with medical schools. It was a problem with higher education overall. Uh, Dr. Ernest Boyer was the president of the Carnegie Foundation uh, here in the uh, 1990s. And he became very worried when he looked to see uh, who was doing the teaching in our universities. Um, and the best universities, the best faculty were they doing research and the TAs were doing teaching. Um, and he was concerned that if the mission of our universities is to bring higher education uh, to the next generation, maybe we were going to fail in that mission, um, seeing that uh, as back, far back as 1990. Um, and he traced the, the history. It's kind of an interesting book, if you have any interest in higher education, about what was a university in the 16th century in America, and the 18th century, and then uh, what happened in the post-war era, particularly when government funding uh, became a significant source of revenue for these universities. Um, this is data from the Carnegie Foundation in 1969. 21% of faculty said it was difficult to achieve tenure without publication. A mere 20 years later, that number had doubled. Um, so there was tremendous pressure on faculty uh, to perish uh, or uh, publish. Uh, and again, he thought this was uh, at the direct uh, expense of uh, this mission of bringing higher education. Um, if you talk to the folks who were on PAP committees at that time, uh, again, the, the um, real um, uh, highly valued uh, piece of faculty effort was new discovery. Um, and he felt, uh, Boyer, when he writes about this, says that uh, it really was based on an old uh, understanding of how new knowledge was generated. It was felt that new knowledge was generated with some theoretical basis uh, that was then tested in research uh, and then applied in practice. And this might have been what was happening in higher uh, institutions, and uh, this was what was happening out in the community. And Boyer argued that it, it's really quite different. Uh, the way new knowledge is generated is you have deep expertise in all of these buckets. Uh, you have folks who spend a lot of time thinking about the theoretical frameworks and designing research studies. And then you have folks that are deeply embedded in practice, and they inform the theorists uh, and the researchers. And a good institution that wants to advance knowledge is going to have deep expertise in all these pockets. 
Um, so we argued that we really needed an expanded view of scholarship to recognize that there are different ways that faculty contribute. Um, and he put forward these four uh, definitions of new uh, types of scholarship. Scholarship of discovery was the typical. Scholarship of integration was the connections across disciplines. Application is actually bringing that to consequential problems. And the fourth was scholarship of teaching. Uh, well, this is a great idea. If you could convince CAP committees that this was a great idea, uh, their response would be, well, that's great. But how do we know that there's excellence in scholarship? It's pretty easy with scholarship and discovery. Uh, we count the publications. How does it work uh, for uh, the rest of it? In the interest of time, we won't go through that. Um, he was followed by uh, Dr. Glassick at the Carnegie Foundation. And uh, he tried to answer that question uh, by uh, going to granting agencies, scholarly press directors, journal editors, and asking the same sort of question. How do you know? Scholarship is excellent, that it's something that you want to uh, put forward. And uh, looked at all those responses and came up uh, with what is known as the Glassic criteria, um, which says that uh, something is truly scholarly if it has clear goals and aims, there's been adequate preparation for the work, one uses appropriate methods, obtains significant results, has effective dissemination, and there's some reflective critique built into the work. And that should be what one is demonstrating in one's uh, portfolio and CV. Think about your last paper you read in the New England Journal of Medicine. It has exactly that structure, right? When we teach curriculum development, a systematic approach, we use this structure uh, so that everyone kind of understands how they're going to be uh, evaluated. Lee Shulman was the last uh, Carnegie uh, president who, who talked about this a little bit. He distinguished the scholarly teacher from teaching scholarship by saying, uh, this is the charismatic guy that shows up and does rounds and uh, inspires everybody but never writes anything. Um, the teaching scholarship is public, it's available for peer review, and it's on a platform. He refers to those as the three Ps um, that uh, differentiates teaching scholarship. Um, as Usha said, this was eventually adopted by the AAMC in thinking about what to do about this new body of clinician educator faculty and coming to a consensus conference. They adopted the classic criteria. And I think if there's anything uh, you should walk out with, it's an understanding of the classic criteria. Uh, that little monograph is available on the AAMC website. If you're coming up for promotion or thinking about your career, Take 10 minutes and go through it because it's quite helpful um, because it uh, offers some examples of how you would show educational scholarship in any of these five activities that the clinician educator uh, tends to remain active in. Evidence of uh, effort, uh, evidence of impact, and evidence of scholarship should all be in the teaching portfolio. And I was so happy to hear that uh, Case Western Reserve has adopted the teaching portfolio. Um, we had major pushback. Um, and my other institution was never accepted. Um, so you're very lucky to have this as a, a way of demonstrating uh, educational scholarship. My final tips here, number one, seek excellence. This is my grandmother's motto. I'm sure everybody's <laughs> heard it. But you know, in those dark days in the East Baltimore Medical Plan where I was in a place I did not want to be, I never intended to be, I still tried to do the best job I could. And lo and behold, that's what got me a great opportunity. Invest in yourself. And I'm, I'm sure the medical students and uh, residents don't want to hear this, uh, the struggling with uh, medical school debt. But you have to continue to invest in yourself. I did not have CME funding uh, in my career. Um, so I had to pay for myself. I paid for myself to go to the Harvard Macy program. I uh, made a commitment that every year, after I'd had that transformational experience, I realized I had a lot to learn. Uh, to do something in faculty development. I took a business of medicine certificate, whatever. Try to find something to do every year uh, that extends the new skill set you're going to need uh, in this uh, career path. Join, volunteer, and do the work for your national organizations. That is so important. Don't just go to a meeting and think because you've networked, you've made the connections you need. You need to do real work. You need to get a reputation that you're somebody who can be counted on to come through on a planning committee or writing. Um, and those are the folks that are going to be your referees when you go forward. 
Uh, mentorship in my story was key. Uh, remember, your mentor may not be in your division or department. Um, seek them out. If you have been mentored, pay it forward. If you're asked to do something for the education of students or residents, this is my advice to clinician, educator, faculty. Always make sure you're going to get paid with an evaluation of your teaching. If it's not there, uh, create it. Uh, tell the course director whatever uh, it has to happen. Make it count. And then make it count twice. Uh, plan for the three Ps. I told you about my clerkship. I was able to publish each and every one of those uh, innovations. So uh, make it count twice. Write, write anything. Uh, it's really hard to write when you're writing notes all day. I understand that. Uh, but uh, just try to write something small, like a book review. Uh, I am actually the editor of a company that seeks out medical education book reviews. If you're interested in writing a 300-word uh, book review, let me know. Um, once you start that, it gets much easier to do more writing. And then um, lastly, uh, Remember why it's great to be on faculty. Um, I failed at both points in the promotion process multiple times. It was not easy to be uh, the test case for the clinician educator pathway where I was, but I was. Um, you're looking at number 159. Uh, but um, this is, uh, again, something from the AAMC uh, that was published just in 2017. It didn't reproduce very well. 30,000 faculty uh, wrote in, uh, a survey, open comments, why do you want to be on, uh, in academic medicine? And what you see in the middle there is that academic medicine provides variety, intellectual stimulation, service. We take care of the patients who need us most, and we train the next generation. It couldn't be a higher calling. Uh, and very fulfilling relationships with our colleagues. Um, it is always great. It is an honor to be an academic uh, faculty, and the promotion thing is just something uh, you've got to live with. Uh, so I'm going to end there, and we're going to go to our panel, I think, Usha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. That was great. I'm going to invite our panel to come up. I'm going to start introducing you in the interest of time. Please wave your hand so people know who you are. <laughs> um, Dr. Karen Horowitz is a professor of medicine whose career has included clinical service, medical education, research, and leadership in national medical societies. She's a member of our Committee on Appointments, Promotions, and Tenure at the School of Medicine. She's contributed to workshops on academic promotion locally and nationally and has been recognized for her educational leadership with a Master Clinician Educator Award from our Department of Medicine. Dr. Mimi Singh is an Associate Professor of Medicine and is the Assistant Dean for Health System Sciences at the School of Medicine. She's also been the PI on the VA Primary Care Center of Excellence, which is a millions-dollar enterprise fostering interdisciplinary training and excellence in chronic diseases management. Dr. Deborah Leisman is an Associate Professor of Medicine, Director of the Undergraduate Medical Education for the Department of Medicine. She also directs the Internal Medicine Clerkship Program, the Internal Medicine Interest Group, and coordinates the MD-PhD Students Clinical Connection while completing their PhD work. She's also my mom's doctor, and she's <laughs> awesome. Attila Nemeth. Dr. Attila Nemeth is an Assistant Professor of Medicine and an Academic Hospitalist at the VA, who will be the Chair of the SGIM Education Committee as of April of 2018, and is currently in the process of building a professional development program for academic hospitalists interested in achieving career recognition as clinician educators. Dr. Charlie Lopresti is an Assistant Professor of Medicine and is currently an Associate Program Director for the Internal Medicine Residency Program creating the GME Spanning Leadership in Medica Medical Education Collaborative, as well as becoming a nationally recognized expert and educator on the use of point-of-care ultrasound, especially in teaching hospitals. Dr. Keith Armitage is the Vice Chair for Education in the Department of Medicine and the longstanding Program Director of the Residency Program for the Department of Internal Medicine. Really longstanding. He was my Program Director. <laughs> He's been recognized nationally and internationally for his educational leadership, including with the presidency of the Association of Program Directors in Internal Medicine. And Dr. Marjorie Greenfield is a professor of OBTYN. Thank you for joining us for Medicine Grand Rounds. 
She's the Vice Chair for Faculty Development in her department and a Society Dean at the School of Medicine. She's authored many books, including the Working Woman's Pregnancy Book, which I highly recommend. She's spoken on topics of mentorship and professional development, both locally and nationally, and has received many awards for her educational leadership. And she, for the residents, Tony Post is Mr. Marjorie Greenfield. <laughs> That's true. And she also... <laughs> she also delivered my two beautiful but badly behaved children. So, um, so we will open up the floor for questions. I have a few questions that I also collected from some faculty that I can um, speak to as well. So anyone? Does anyone want to start? Yes. Terrific. Uh, it, I guess you have to be a David to be a mentor for me, right? <laughs> that was great. But uh, in terms of the a portfolio that's presented either at the department level or at the school cap committee level. What is your recommendation in terms of what that should uh, contain? You went over that a little bit at the end in terms of your five tips, but uh, this is really, I have to say, being <clears throat> on you know in my position, but also the chair of the School of Medicine cap committee in the past, one of the hardest decisions I think that the committee members face that is judging someone on their education and scholarship in that regard. So we did uh, devote a grand rounds last year, I think. We talked about the educators' uh, portfolio quite a bit. Again, it is used nationally and internationally, so you can get a lot of uh, help uh, looking at uh, other places and what they recommend for it. Um, where it falls off, I think, is where you spend a lot of time showing quantity of teaching effort and not impact of teaching effort, which is why uh, the teaching evaluations are so critical, uh, what your former students say about you is so critical, uh, those folks who have gone on to have their own successful careers and uh, how you impacted that, I think, is uh, critical. Uh, as we said, we need that teaching in our institutions. Uh, in order to train the next generation. And I don't think you should feel embarrassed about uh, making that uh, statement about your impact. Uh, but try to get some kind of the three Ps in there, some kind of writing. Um, again, uh, depending on your CV structure, you may only be allowed to put peer-reviewed publications in one little uh, compartment of the CV. Well, maybe you've done something uh, with the uh, Scholars Teaching Award uh, here. That is an external peer-reviewed award uh, that looks at scholarly work. Uh, make sure that's in there. Make sure that you explain to the CAP committee how that award comes about uh, and that the meaning of it. Um, as much as you can, get the three Ps. What, where were you public? Uh, what was your platform? What kind of peer review was involved? Can I make a comment, Usha? I think um, an important part of the portfolio are evaluations. And you know, for all the students and residents in the audience, those evaluations matter. Almost every faculty member in the Department of Medicine who goes up for promotion asks for me about a letter for their teaching. And usually it's really easy because there's lots of wonderful evaluations from students, residents, and fellows. And I have a whole system. You've probably seen my letters. I have a whole system for cutting and pasting what's in my evaluation.com. So your evaluation comments are particularly helpful for creating a portfolio and most faculty that do a lot of teaching, a lot of interaction and contact with students, residents, and fellows have a big portfolio of, uh, of really strong evaluation comments. And so do your evaluations and, make, and write comments. Can I, can I make two other comments about, <laughs> about there's, there's a, a good thing and bad thing about our medical school and for people in the clinician educative pathway. One of the great things is that for, for faculty in a non-tenure pathway, you don't have some kind of second class title. You're, you're an assistant professor of medicine, you know, associate. It's a lot of medical schools, you're, if you're in the tenure track, you're a professor of medicine. If you're in the non-tenure track, you're a clinical professor of medicine. So our medical school doesn't do that, which I think is nice. The hardest thing about our medical school is a, a university requirement that is to, be, to go from assistant to associate professor, you have to have regional recognition. And, and to go from associate professor to professor, you have to have national recognition. And that's a university requirement, right, not a medical school requirement. And I think that's very, very intimidating for clinician educators. How do I get regional recognition? How do I get national recognition? What does that mean? And, um, it, but if you break it down, it's not that hard. So I, I heard that Attila is the chairman of the SGIM Education Committee. 
that is natural recognition. So kudos. So what? You know, so what you do is, if you're a clinician educator, you're not you're not publishing papers, you're not getting NIH grants, but you're your focus, you need to be involved in regional associations and national associations. You need, you need to be involved in committees, in leadership projects, in task forces. You need to present posters, do workshops. And those, are, and then you get known regionally or nationally and then ask people from those associations, those relationships, for letters of recommendation. That's your portfolio that shows you have regional recognition and national recognition. It's not that hard to do. You just have to get involved in organizations, whatever your focus is, clinically or educationally, get involved in organizations outside of university circle, and you can get the regional and national recognition. It's not that hard. So those are the points that I wanted to make before this. Thank you very much. Can I add one thing to that? Please. So I have also chaired the, the Case Western Medical School Committee on Promotions and Tenure, and I think one of the key things in this isn't just doing regional and national things, but making it really, really obvious in your portfolio and in your CV. Cal, you know, making separate sections for regional, separate sections for national, because the people that are reading this, a lot of them are PhD researchers that don't do the same thing that our clinician educators do, and the coin of the realm is publications, and that's what they know, that's how they, that's how they value things. And you have to be able to say, I have other ways of showing my regional and national reputation, and then you have to say, this is a showing of regional reputation. Karen, did you want to speak to that? Well, speaking to the, the title of educator, I think it's important for people to understand that when you graduate this program, you are a content expert in your field. But being an educator is different from the see one, do one, teach one that we, that we do as residents, and we do carry that into our um, practice as um, attendings. We get on the wards. We've seen that before. We teach it to the next person. We look forward to to their learning from our experience. But that's what a teacher does. An educator reflects on that and asks, how did I deliver the content? How do I know that the learner understood it? And how can I demonstrate that I was an effective transmitter of that material? So we learn these things in a lot of different ways. When I came to Case, I never had an anticipation that I was going to be on an academic track at all. But I got here, and someone said, Join, go to the wards and teach. So I did what Pat, what Pat mentioned. I didn't have a budget for it, but I looked up. American College of Physicians has a seminar on how to, be a, how to teach in the clinic. And then Society of General and Internal Medicine had what is a clinician educator. And you find these little kernels of, of, of material, and you grow in a different direction. And each year, as Pat said, I set an agenda to learn something different, not only in my area of interest, but in how to do it better. And um, it develops you, it de develops you in a different direction, gives you networks, and give you, gives you ways of presenting your, your work and the value, value of what you do to others. So Pat's department has a whole bunch of different educational programs people can go to right here. There's the Center for Academic Medical Education, um, managed by Clara Papp. There's um, these different tracks for a clinician educator, for um, developing as a researcher and so forth. People should use those things. People should find out what educational platforms are here locally and what they need to go away for and engage in them in each level of your training and beyond. Thank you. Um, I think we'll, are there any questions from the audience? I have another question given by a faculty member, if not. Go ahead, Bob. So one of the things that this school took the lead on is developing an approach to promotion and tenure for team scientists. How do you view this in the context of teaching, and should there be further initiatives to consider that? Because much of what we do is in that context. This actually came up. I was thinking about this because I was asked to write a referee letter for a colleague uh, who has spent her entire career in the community organization, uh, but she is the go-to person every time uh, there was a research protocol uh, or an educational effort where they wanted to uh, do it in the community. 
so she appears in multiple funding uh, grants and multiple publications as the fifth author, whatever. But it's a classic team scientist, except it's in educational uh, program building and not in a research program. So I think it should count just as much. Those things wouldn't have gotten off the ground if uh, she had not been an active participant there. Um, and again, I think it's up to us as leaders uh, to make the statement that we need those cohesive teams in order to make these complicated projects work. Someone uh, brought up a question about, oh, I'm sorry, Marjorie, did you want to speak to that? Go ahead. I was just going to add, again, it, the key thing with presenting yourself to the Promotions Committee is the documentation of what your role was. Um, people had some questions about um, publishing educational scholarship versus NetEd portal, um, this uh, piece of Glasses Criteria, the dissemination piece. Um, what are ways in which to do that that um, are appropriate for academic promotion? I don't know, Mimi, if you want to take a mm -hmm. stab at that, maybe. Okay. So, um, okay, this works. So I think um, one of the things that came up both in the slides and a lot of the discussion around is, you know, making sure you count it twice. And I think one of the big, the biggest step in that um, before you decide where you're going to publish is the evaluation piece is I think what gets often left out in the clinical education because you're so busy doing and you're so busy implementing and rightly so. Most people who are doing this are very passionate about what they do. They love teaching and so the evaluation or the measurement piece is sort of an afterthought and then unfortunately when it's all done you're like oh it would have been great had we measured it, had we looked at this because then all of a sudden the scholarship piece kind of falls into place. And so one thing that um, before even thinking about where it, just to always keep the evaluation piece right up there with the doing piece, and I know that's easier said than done, but something I um, personally have done is because a lot of my work is in quality improvement, one of the things up front in quality improvement is when you make a change, the second question is how do you know that that change was an improvement? And so just using that rubric has been something that I sort of left I have um, used a lot in my education portfolio as part of my, um, because if we're going to actually make an intervention or if we're going to actually do uh, a curriculum development or change, the next question automatically sitting still at the table is, well, how do we know that that change is going to be an improvement? And it's not going to be a gut reaction. Are we going to survey folks and things like that? So I think before you decide where you're going to publish, really having that evaluation or that measurement piece up front is something that I learned. Unfortunately, a little um, along, you know, a hard way, but I think because of the QI rubric and the way I started to think about things, it's been really helpful. Um, in terms of the question related to where to publish, um, things like MedEd Portal, these are actually very valuable and very, um, they're peer-reviewed, and one of the things that people a lot of times think that it's not a uh, publication in a journal, but actually MedEd Portal, if, for those who use it, it's actually a, a well site, a place that a lot of folks go to, and it is, again, it goes through a very, um, um, it does go through a peer review process. So it's something that uh, I think a lot of committees actually take very seriously. So from that standpoint, uh, uh, an important thing. I don't know if other people want to yeah, comment I'll just, on that. I'll piggyback off of what Mimi just said. So one of the things that I struggled with very early on was this whole concept of making it count twice. It's funny, I was just talking with some residents yesterday about this, but, you know, I remember very clearly going to national conferences and they would present, oh, here's this new way of doing something. I'd be like, oh, I've been doing that for two years, right? And so the key is anytime you develop some kind of curriculum, anytime that you put something novel together, it helps to plan it out, right? It's very hard. A lot of people get caught evaluating after the fact, right? Because you didn't ask the right questions to start with. So anytime that you create a curriculum, really define your learning objectives. Really think about what your goals are, and then come up with a way to be able to study that. Because um, that's really what you need to, to sort of present it nationally and get recognition for it. How many people on this panel have gotten a scholarship in teaching award? How many people in the audience have gotten a scholarship in teaching award? You guys know what that is? So this is an award that is a, that you submit an application, you get an email about it each year on a cycle, and you have to basically 
it, it forces you to present your education project in a scholarly way. And it is also peer reviewed, and you can put it in your awards and honors, and you can also put it in your kind of peer reviewed um, products. Um, and again, that it sort of sets you up for being able to multi use a project because it forces you to do it properly. And then you, it often sets you up for being able to publish it. Yeah, it uses it. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes, Bob, go ahead, please. Yeah. So uh, turning to Charlie and Deb, uh, how do we acclimate residents as well as medical students in this whole area, exciting area of uh, education uh, from the get-go? And Charlie, can you speak about your program that you've established and Deb, what you do as well? Sure. So. Um, the leadership in medical education pathway, we started in the Department of Medicine four years ago now, and since then it's sort of taken on this GME-wide initiative, now involves psychiatry and neurology as well. And it really revolves around this, this whole concept of people that want to be in the medical education realm, you know, giving them sort of the, the tools to succeed in that. So, you know, Dr. Thomas has spoken to the group, Clara Path has spoken to the group, and a lot of this is, again, how to build an educational portfolio, how to evaluate curriculum. Um, and that's something that's offered to the residents in the pathway. I think, you know, finding ways to, you know, do more stuff like this and actually get it, you know, to the categoricals as well um, so that everybody has those tools would be fantastic. Because a lot of the time you just, you know, you go through residency and this is, this is what happened to me. I went through residency, it was all clinical, 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 and then you get out and you find yourself in these positions where you're creating curriculum and you're just sort of, trying to figure it out on your own, which is, in hindsight, not the best way of doing it. Um, so in my role with the students, I'm always looking for at different levels because I, as the mentor for the internal medicine interest group and also as the clerkship director, I, I see my group here, um, always looking for ways to kind of advance you as teachers, and you're always teachers. And I think one of the things the medical school does really well is it uses the fourth-year students to mentor the younger students, and it has the upper years mentoring the younger years, and that's actually a really valuable aspect of the medical school. Um, that's what I'd say for now. Yeah, and I just, I'll just say one last thing. So for mentorship is huge, and I don't think you necessarily understand this all the time. Um, I, I advise residents, obviously, and many of them come to me, and they haven't found their ideal mentor, right? They view mentorship as there's this one person that I need to meet, and they're going to help me through everything, right? And I would encourage you all to, you know, tap into multiple mentors, right? You may have a clinician mentor. You may have an administrative mentor. You may have a research mentor. Um, don't, don't focus on trying to find that one sort of ideal. I have to tap that, too, just for the students who are here, because it really is um, – somebody once came to me who I was – I thought I'd – she had been on the clerkship, and I would really spend time with her, and our attendees had spent time with her. And she went to the society dean, and he said, well, who's on your team? And she came to talk to me. We actually met for coffee. And I said, I think I need to hold up a paddle. I'm on your team. You use me. I'm on your team. But don't be afraid to contact attendings. Don't be afraid to reach out to attendings. We're all here at this institution because we're choosing to do this and because we know that that's part of what we love doing and we're, and we're passionate about it. So don't be afraid to reach out to the attendings and to the residents and to ask them, we recently, our internal medicine interest group just set up so that the LME residents are mentors to our internal medicine interest group leaders. And I, I don't even know if you're here, the one who's here, but so passionate. They had such a great interaction. So there's just, it might not be defined, just like feedback isn't always defined as feedback. Mentoring isn't always defined, but don't be afraid to tap into the, the people here and the people at this institution. Um, there was a question for promotion purposes. Um, is there any differentiation between teaching medical students and teaching residents um, for the Committee on Appointments, Promotions, and Tenure? I don't know if any of you guys want to speak to that. Not anymore. There used to be, but that really has gone by the wayside, teaching's teaching. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other? Did you have a question?
I'm just going to repeat the question for the remote audience. Um, for someone who's um, just starting out in a career as a medical educator, are there any one or two great resources that you would recommend um, as a, a place to, to look? I mean, there, there's well, lo locally, there's there's Camel. Again, I, I think for people that are involved either in as clerkship directors, fellowship directors, or residency directors, there's there's um, national associations, and those meetings are all about faculty development. And you know, that's where I got my faculty development for the last three or four years. <laughs> and, Not uh, that long. <laughs> uh, I, said, I said three to four. Um, okay, I thought you said 34. <laughs> So there are, medical societies do different things. Society of Gentle, General Internal Medicine has been my academic home for about 25 years, and it's an it's an organization that um, is made up of academic physicians from all of the leading institutions in the country, and there are large large percentage of the membership talks about um, being a clinician educator and learning to develop excellence in that area. And they support each other in academic projects, and um, it's a great place to start. American College of Physicians has similar um, programs, so those are the two biggies for internists. Say, Jim, Society of Hospitalist Hospital Medicine is, is Jim, another one. So I my big education was when I became a member of the clerkship directors in internal medicine. And going to the national meeting and meeting my colleagues was fantastic. And then, as Keith said, I got involved in workshops with other people and writing papers with other people and innovating educational innovations with others. It really, um, it was really amazing. And we still, there's a CDIM discussion blog that I tap into regularly where we come up with topics and ideas. And we're, I just saw Dr. Thomas just had a comment on today's blogs talking about when she presented uh, the climate control. So I was just noticing that for clerkship directors all over. And it, we really try to help each other out, and that was huge. Yeah, so there are a lot of national workshops and conferences you can go to. For medical students and residents who don't necessarily afford that, mm -hmm. um, ACP actually has a great book set on, on teaching, um, and it runs about 130 bucks. It's six books covering from you know inpatient teaching to outpatient teaching to careers in academic medicine. It's a really nice resource. And then one that was already mentioned that um, the Harvard Macy program, which is very expensive, but one of the things that I would say is that um, if you actually do um, prove or demonstrate that you're, that is something you want to do, um, a lot of times the department or your, or your program will pick up the cost for you. So just recognize that that is, again, an opportunity for, um, for not only networking, but really getting a chance to work with other educators. And locally, I want to make a plug again for the Scholarship and Teaching Awards. I think just taking a project that you're doing and trying to do it using Glassic's criteria is a way of making yourself academic and setting yourself up for success. That There's lots of mentors that you can get just here, but going through the process of putting together a scholarship and teaching application is really worthwhile. And sign up for the annual education retreat yeah, at the definitely. School of Medicine because you'll meet other people in your career track. You'll get exposed to at least one national speaker every year. To, yeah. uh, so it's March 20th this year at Tink and Veal. It's free. Uh, you get CME uh, credit for it. But we've got some great international speakers, Atul Grover from the AAMC, and uh, Dr. Lingard is an expert in collective competence uh, from Toronto's Wilson Center. Uh, and then we actually have a faculty member who teaches executive leadership from um, the Weatherhead School of Management doing a workshop in the afternoon. And um, those executive leaders pay big bucks for that workshop. You're going to get it for free. Uh, but he's talking about emotional intelligence and physician leaders. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So there's another program right here in our backyard. It's called Skittle for short, but it's Scholars Col Collaboration in Teaching and Learning. And that's actually, again, something very unique to CWRU. And one of the things that happens there is you as a faculty get paired up with either a medical student or a resident, likely medical student, who wants to work on a project. And you get basically coaching and get a chance over the year to work on the project and um, 
hopefully convert it into, again, a, a scholarship and the, something that uh, at the annual education retreat get a chance to um, present and give feedback. Did you want to mention? Um, all right. Uh, oh, okay. One, one last question. This is very exciting as an old timer here. And I had no understanding of what um, what you've been doing, but I'm the, so I'm asking, where is the publication of this? How do we? Somebody that wanted to know more about this as he entering the career in our website, the School of Medicine on the internet. I don't see this. I didn't know that this was coming up. Uh, the education retreat uh, yeah, I mean, should have gone I, out in a blast. Uh, Marjorie, you probably know uh, best what's in the faculty development websites for the School of Medicine, uh, but CAMEL uh, is listed there, um, and um, there's something called the Faculty Toolkit Series, which are two Yeah, the meetings. education retreat email usually goes out um, quite early in the year as a save the date, and then there will be one or two more. So I think just making sure you're on Dr. Anker's list serve is, is yeah. probably... I hope that you yeah. make this... Yeah. Publicize what you're trying to do, where you can find it on our yeah. local internet. Yeah. All right. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and our keynote speakers for giving their time and expertise today. Thank you.